Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBN Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimmeron Marine Ecosystems and Management, which are both services of OCTO. Uh, and we want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, I also have with me uh, John Davis, who is the president of and founder of OCTO, uh, who is co-moderator. And we have, uh, we're very pleased to welcome Frith Dunkley and Jean-Luc Solande of the Marine Conservation Society to talk today about the climate impacts of offshore bottom trawling, managing sediment carbon storage in the UK post-Brexit. Um, and and Jean-Luc and Frith, you can go ahead and, and share your slides. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, we, uh, you can send the questions either through the chat panel or the question panel. Um, you can post in either, and we will, and we'll have dedicated time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we, we we won't take audio questions, and, and uh, we'll hold most of the questions for the end. But if you have quick clarifying questions, um, we might be able to handle those during. Um, for the chat, it is enabled so that anyone can post um, to all attendees if you choose. Uh, we just ask that if you do choose to post to all attendees, you keep it on the subject matter at hand and keep it professional. Um, but it, it's actually a great way for uh, sharing uh, resources, information about the topic. All right, thank you so much, uh, Frith and Jean-Luc, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I, I hope everyone can see me okay. I'm going to start my video. Okay. Yes, Hello. we can. Okay, is that cool? Good. Okay, so um, this is a culmination of about a year's worth of research by the Marine Conservation Society, a report published on the 6th of January. Um, um, we wanted to look at definitely where fishing was taking place in our marine protected areas, particularly using bottom toed fishing gears. Um, but then thereafter, we incorporated evidence and of um, carbon storage habitat um, aligned to that, which Frith will go into in great detail. Just trying to go to the next slide. Okay, so there's great interest in climate change and the role of the oceans in mitigating climate change and actually absorbing some of the worst impacts of climate change that have occurred already. This very important report came out, I think in 2019, and there's a similar report by the IPCC or to the IPCC around 2019. And really fundamentally from this report, it, it states that there are um, two areas in particular where we should look at the oceans mitigating climate change. There could be up to about 21 to 25 percent of the restoration we need and the absorption we need of carbon um, to meet net um, two degree climate change by the end of 2100. And those are that we need to restore and protect our coastal marine ecosystems. And possibly most relevant to this presentation that is nascent science of which we are sort of teetering on the edges of in this work. The carbon storage is in the seabed and we need to preserve that carbon storage habitat. And indeed, I would argue further than that, we need to restore those natural ecosystems, both coastally and offshore, that can absorb carbon, store it and sequester it. And that's what this work is partly about. So let's look at our, our resources that we have to combat um, climate change with the natural ecosystem. And they are marine protected areas uh, in the UK. We have an enormous number of marine protected areas, 358 that cover 38% of the UK seas. 36% of the surface area of the marine protected areas are offshore. There are enormous sites um, which are largely off the east coast of um, East Anglia. These are for harbour porpoise and other species which are migratory. There's also a, a, an, another marine protected area for migratory species for harbour porpoise, again, off North Cornwall and off West Wales, stretching into Northern Ireland. And this large site here also has aspects of um, mobile species conservation, basking sharks and minke whales. 
And the largest MPA in Europe has just been designated in September, which is this enormous site off the west coast of Scotland in abyssal depths. I mean, the average depth is over a thousand meters there. And bottoms trawling is already banned to 800 meters. You can't bottom trawl in the EU seas outside 800 meters. So that's already in effect kind of protected. Nevertheless, 98% of marine protected areas are designated for aspects of the seabed. And this expansion has been massive because of the, the, the concerns of the state of biodiversity and I think wider ecosystem processes. Um, they are a combination of European and domestic MPA designations. Um, the UK was part of the European community and the European Union up until January this year, in effect, there was a year's grace period offered to the UK and Europe to come up with a deal um, between January 2020 and January 2021. Um, so we still retain those marine protected areas designated under European law. It's been shifted into UK law. So we haven't lost them and we haven't lost the laws that are there to protect the sites. So that's very important moving forwards. But we also have added to that in the past decade with a raft of domestic marine protected areas, well over 100, particularly designated in English and Scottish waters. But the way the UK does it, I think has been rather daft um, and rather um, uh, clumsy and inefficient. We have done designation then management. If the, in the California Marine Life Protected Areas Act, as far as I'm aware, the designation was done at the time the management was organized. In the Great Barrier Reef and many of the Australian marine protected area processes, stakeholders were involved in talking about zonation of management. So the regulations were there at the time designation occurred. We in the UK, I don't think logically, have done the management after designation. So many of our marine protected areas are actually unprotected. But there's a lot to play with here. The offshore, offshore sites are large. The Dogger Bank in the UK part of the site is over 12,000 square kilometers. So it's a lot that we can do with the ecosystem. These are tools. They aren't the panoply, they aren't the uh, but they aren't the end game, but they will actually really contribute to some of the issues we cover in this talk, like climate change and ecosystem processes. Now, the UK, the UK and the European types of marine protected areas are based on this feature-based approach, which um, has been troublesome, according to many of us MPA practitioners. Um, we look at isolated features within sites that are necessary for conservation, and that's, this has led to a bit of a crisis in terms of just protecting the bits that are continually okay or continue to be okay or are inaccessible to certain damaging activities. As I said earlier, 90, over 95% of the sites are for the seabed. Um, we must retain that in our minds in this presentation and in terms of the role of these areas. Um, but I believe that we have no effective baseline condition of these sites. Many of these sites have been trawled and continue to be trawled. And so should we, should we consider their um, current status to be um, as a good environmental baseline? Probably not in my, my viewpoint. So management of these sites and particularly offshore sites. Um, we have a difference between our offshore sites and inshore sites in terms of the powers we're able to bestow on the management of fishing activities, particularly in those sites in relation to our relationship with the European Union. Now, in the past, we had to do something called a joint recommendation with our EU colleagues who were interested in fishing outside 12 nautical miles. That involved all EU member states, would you believe, in, in their uh, considerations of the activities that a hosting member state of an MPA might want to manage. So if the UK wanted to protect a site from all trawling activities, it had to have agreement from all other EU member states. Um, and that led to really a watering down of the ambition of conservation measures, and I'll bring it up an illustrative example in a minute. And I think that there was no consideration of the wide ecosystem services of these marine protected areas. And I think our consciousness and our awareness through science is developing of something other than just the features for which we're thinking of protecting these sites for in their designation to their overarching ability to make our seas much healthier, which requires more stringent management. In light of that, at the same time as we've been trying to develop these joint recommendations, the UK developed a revised approach to marine protected area management to fisheries in 2012. Um, that led to many inshore sites with the black lines around the orange polygons. Those are the inshore sites which were within the gift of the UK to protect 
without having to ask other EU member states not to fish in them. For two reasons, One's, one, because the law stated that, and two, because no EU member state is allowed to fish within six nautical miles of our coast. So you can see there's variability of success in that arena where bottom trawling has been excluded in the southwest of the United Kingdom. If you follow my pointer, there's been large areas or most of the tracts of marine protected areas are protected from bottom trawling, but they tend to be in areas of rocky um, granite bedrock. So the trawlers don't want to go there anyway. <laughs> um, in the east, there's variable success. Some sites have seen protection measures since, here, since this slide was prepared, but you can see there's less protection in the inshore because of interest by bottom trawling fleets in those marine protected areas. And MPA has made um, very clear recommendations. These we regard as illegal based on the laws in those sites um, to the disagreement with some of the local regulators. But as you'll notice from this slide, none of the offshore sites beyond this important 12 nautical mile zone where we had to ask through joint recommendation other member states not to fish, I've got any black lines around them at all. Here, here, this is a Dogger Bank, this is Haysborough, Ham this is uh, North Norfolk Sandbanks, I think, this site here, and this site off the west coast of Cornwall. None of them received measures because it was too complicated and too political. And this led to an impasse. UK wanted to protect those sites to a certain extent um, up to Brexit. And then when Brexit occurred in January 2021, in effect, we have the gift to work unilaterally to protect these sites. This is very important as long as we are non-discriminatory in the measures, i.e. the measures to protect the sites in fishing terms um, apply equally to UK boats as they do to boats from other member states of the European Union. Very important that point, but we can act unilaterally on the basis of our scientific understanding of what these sites should be. Now let's think of one site. I mentioned the Dogger Bank earlier. It's a sandbank which was, which was um, submerged at the end of the last glacial period, so about 8,000 years ago. So this is a quite a new habitat in a way. It's only been around for 8,000 to 10,000 years. Now it's a bank that extends beyond the waters of the United Kingdom, which are here, one, to the waters of the Dutch EEZ, e e Exclusive Economic Zone, and also into Germany's waters here. The bank extends into the Danish waters that Denmark didn't want to put a protected area there. Now, it's a very important sandbank for loads of ecosystem processes that enhance the productivity of the North Sea. So sand eels are very important, and we all know sand eels, high in omega-3 oils, are really important in their biomass for boosting the, the marine ecosystem. Those organisms um, are the base of the food chain that protects our organisms like seabirds and, and dolphins. Now, on the benthos, um, there used to be historical populations of oysters and sponge and corals, such as these dead men's fingers, soft corals. And those communities have been effectively degraded um, over hundreds of years, use, of years of use. Now, this joint recommendation process, which I talked about earlier, led to this multi-management approach where only the green area was protected in perpetuity. Um, and a certain small green area here in the Dutch waters was going to be considered for protection. And there was going to be a multi-management approach to this wider area here with allowance for demersal seining. That's um, four kilometer long metal enhanced ropes, which would lead to a, a net which, which, which is winched towards a vessel. So not really a protected area in the minds of the NGOs that sent a complaint to the European Commission um, in 2019. Um, WWF and Client Earth said this isn't good enough, this doesn't meet the minimum requirements of the regulations. So since Brexit, the UK now has the opportunity to manage this site autonomously. And at the same time as we're looking at the ecosystems of these MPAs, um, UK government was offered some quite compelling scientific evidence from a, a multitude of partners, not just scientists, but lawyers, um, practitioners, even certain elements of the fishing industry and regulators um, got together to do a couple of publications talking about moving away from feature-based protection to whole site management of sites. Whole site in the ecosystem context that we should protect um, various parts of the ecosystem because they are contiguous. And this is illustrated by this very simple diagram by Sophie Elliott, um, which shows that fish move between habitats and they are uh, important to have a functioning benthic ecosystem in order to allow them to, to survive, breed and provide um, the, the biomass for the oceans. So by, by the beginning of 2020, we now have autonomy. 
Um, we are free at last, according to the Brexiteers. Um, we can protect whole sites because the government has produced all sorts of evidence that it uh, wants to move towards whole site base of protection. Um, the negotiations to undertake joint recommendations palpably failed with other member states, so we can go it alone. There's increasing media interest. There is a threat potentially of court action by some NGOs towards UK government for inaction. We're starting to see direct action through frustration of NGOs. So Greenpeace have been dropping, dropping blocks into two MPAs, the Dogger Bank and one south of Brighton. Um, and then we wanted to ask, which is where the next part of the presentation goes on to, which countries are bottom trawl fishing in our offshore, offshore MPAs and at what cost? So that leads to this research. That's really the background to, to the research. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and we'll move over to Frith's area of the presentation. Bear with me one second and I will share my screen. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so um, I'm just going to go through um, how we uh, produce the report, the analysis um, and our findings. Um, so the, the two main areas we were focusing on um, in the report are finding out how much demersal fishing effort um, takes place within our offshore MPAs designated for seabed features. And then secondly, to look at this um, in the context of how much carbon is stored there and the potential for that carbon to be uh, disturbed and um, released contributions to climate change. So first of all, um, going through the demersal fishing effort. Um, we got our data from an organization called Global Fishing Watch, who are a, a, an organization who take uh, tracking data collected from automatic identification systems, um, which is a sort of piece of technology that vessels use to communicate their um, locations to one another um, to uh, avoid collisions. So it's a safety feature. Um, in the EU, it's a legal uh, requirement for all vessels over 15 metres in length to um, have this equipment uh, installed and switched on. Um, so basically what Global Fishing Watch do is they take the tracks from these vessels, um, they pass them through a series of um, algorithms, and those algorithms um, work out when those vessels are fishing, and they can infer what sort of gear that they're using. Um, and this data is um, publicly available, and it's available um, in uh, in a way that could be filtered by uh, fishing gear. So the uh, fishing gears we were interested in for the purposes of this project uh, were dredging, uh, demersal send, and trawling. Now, because Global Fishing Watch um, provide their trawling data mix, mixing uh, pelagic and demersal trawling, we had to do a little bit of extra work um, and cross-reference the Global Fishing Watch data with the EU fleet register. So um, through doing this, we um, basically told the Global Fishing Watch data set that we wanted all the fishing effort data for vessels using demersal trawls, um, dredges and demersal sends. So once we got this data, um, we performed an overlay analysis. So essentially um, took the spatial data of the distribution of fishing effort and then um, overlaid the uh, boundary data for um, offshore marine protected areas in the UK that are designated for a seabed feature um, and then just found out how much fishing effort um, was recorded within each of the boundaries and turns out it's quite a lot. <laughs> um, so the data we had available to us at the time um, was 2015 to 2018 um, and during that time uh, practically all the MPAs that have been designated during that time um, had experienced some level of demersal fishing. Um, half of the MPAs um, had over a thousand hours recorded in them and over 10% of them had over 5,000 hours. Um, and overall there was nearly 90,000 hours recorded within that four year period. Now it's worth saying that um, this is an underestimate. Um, it's a very high number, but it's very likely to be much higher. Um, this is because um, during the data processing, um, we were having to exclude any vessels that were using pelagic trawls as well as demersal trawls because we needed to be sure that the data we were getting um, was specifically demersal fishing effort. So it, it, it really adds to the story really that um, whilst these numbers, whilst these hours of this have, there's a huge amount that's been recorded, um, in, in reality, it's much likely to be higher. 
So just to, in the interest of time, just focus on some of the um, the, the sort of the worst offenders in terms of um, MPAs. And um, these were the top three. Um, so the high, the MPA with the highest um, amount of fishing recorded within it, the highest fishing rate is the Central Flood and um, Nature Conservation MPA up here in the um, in the North Sea. Um, and this is closely followed by um, the Margate and Longsands uh, Special Area of Conservation and the Hayes, Braham and Winston Special Area of Conservation down here in the east of England. Um, and what you can see here is the fishing effort distribution isn't equal. Um, and even within MPAs, um, there are hotspots of fishing activity, um, which does um, indicate that even targeted management measures would have a huge impact um, on, on protecting the features. Um, and now carry on focusing on these on the, the top um, MPAs for the, with the highest fish, fishing rates. One thing that Global Fishing Watch data does allow us to do um, is to actually drill down into the data and find out who is doing the fishing. Um, so this graph just shows um, the fleet composition of the, of the fishing activity for each of the sites, the top 10 sites. Um, and as you can see, Central Flood and the um, small um, MPA, or quite a large MPA in the North Sea. Um, the UK fleet was the dominant fleet um, fishing there, but that's not the case everywhere. Um, Margate and Longsands, um, the most dom dominant fleet was the Belgian fleet, um, and Hayesbraham and the Winston is the Dutch fleet. Um, now, interestingly, we, we uh, think that the Dutch fleet in the Hayes, Braham and Winston um, MPA um, is most likely to be using electric pulse fishing, which since leaving the EU has actually been made illegal to use this type of gear in UK waters. Um, so it would be very interesting um, to find out whether this effort changes at all um, with more recent data um, or whether um, it stays the same, but the, the, the vessels are just switching to more traditional uh, gear types. So moving on, on now to the uh, carbon aspect of the project. Now, originally we um, had planned to focus the project just on demersal fishing, um, but we thought due to the um, importance of the climate emergency and um, in the context of um, the UK hosting the COP26 later this year, um, we thought it'd be very interesting to find out how this fishing effort relates to um, carbon stored in the seabed um, around the UK. So for this, um, we used data from this paper by uh, Dr. Lubizetti et al. Um, this is basically the group of geochemists and, and environmental economists from CFAS, um, which is the UK uh, Government Fisheries and Agriculture Science Department. Um, and this, this study basically uh, finds out how much carbon um, is stored in marine environments around the UK, and then uh, quantifies the cost of disturbing these environments um, in terms of emissions. Um, so this report found that 93% uh, of the carbon stored in the UK's marine environments is stored in the shelf sea sediments. And this is particularly important for us because looking at the offshore MPAs, um, the majority of these consist of and, and protect or are designated to protect shelf uh, sediments. Um, so this report found that there was uh, 205, there is 205 megatons of carbon stored, currently stored in shelf sea sediments around the UK. In terms of the economic cost, um, through a series of um, economic modelling, um, Luizetti et al worked out that uh, after 25 years, um, under a scenario of increased pressures from climate change and human activities, um, the continued disturbance of seabed sediments uh, will cost $12 billion um, to mitigate. So this is an abatement cost, so it basically means that um, it's the amount of money it would cost to mitigate the effects of the increase of greenhouse gas emissions that would result from the disturbance. So using this uh, carbon storage data, the 205 megatons of carbon stored and the $12 billion uh, US dollars um, disturbance costs, we ran some fairly uh, coarse um, calculations um, just to try and get um, a, a picture of, of the potential for MPAs um, as not just uh, a tool for protecting biodiversity, but also for protecting valuable carbon stores. Um, so running these calculations, we found that uh, the marine protected areas, offshore marine protected areas around the UK um, encompass about 13% of the UK's uh, shelf sediment. Um, so this equates to about 27 megatons of carbon. And 
as you can see, different sizes of MPAs means different amounts of carbon stored um, using these course calculations. Um, and our largest MPA um, in the shelf sediment area is Dogger Bank, um, which has the potential to store about five megatons of carbon. Now in terms of uh, cost of disturbing this carbon, um, using the $12 billion uh, value, uh, we've worked out that using the fished area of each MPA, so using that global fishing watch data and working out the footprint of the fishing activity, um, continued trawling of marine protected areas in a similar pattern to what we see now um, could cost about a billion pounds over uh, 25 years to mitigate. And in Dogger Bank alone, that equates to uh, nearly 200 million pounds over 25 years. Now, as I've mentioned, these uh, carbon calculations were very coarse and um, it assumes, for example, that the carbon distribution um, is equal across the continental shelf, which um, it's not. <laughs> um, so uh, the first step um, after this research is to basically refine the carbon metrics. Uh, we've been in talks with geochemists at St Andrews University to talk about, um, find out more about um, carbon cycling um, and we have more uh, refined data um, looking at the actual distribution of carbon um, in shelf sediments. So next step is to apply this, a similar analysis, um, but using much more precise data. Uh, we will also be running similar uh, projects looking at um, finding out how much fishing activity happens in offshore wind. So a similar analysis, but instead of using marine protected area boundaries, using boundaries of offshore wind farms. Um, and we've also been uh, carrying out similar research for um, charities, conservation charities in Europe through our partnership with Seas at Risk, who are a coalition of um, EU NGOs. And one such um, project we've just completed is um, working with um, the French NGO FNE, um, where we um, pr provided similar fishing um, effort data, but this time for pelagic trawling, uh, gill netting, as well as the demersal trawling. Um, and this was to support their work um, lobbying over common dolphin bycatch. And they've produced this um, rather nifty interactive map that you can use to find out how much fishing happens inside MPAs in the Bay of Biscay, um, what those sites are designated for and what sorts of fishing is happening there. And we ourselves have our own um, interactive map um, where we've made all the data that we have uh, produced in this uh, report available. So if you're interested in looking at the data on a more site by site, site basis, um, that's the place to go to have a look at sort of more, more um, localised um, analysis. So in terms of the campaign, um, we are currently engaging with um, UK government um, to call for a ban on bottom trawling in offshore um, MPA designated for seabed features. Um, and we will also be uh, bringing this report to the attention of leaders at the COP26 later this year. Um, and this project really does add to um, a body of work that many NGOs are pushing for at the moment. And when we released the report, um, it did really catch the attention of the UK press. Um, it's partly due to when we um, released it. So we left, Bre we left the EU on the 1st of January and released the report on the 6th of January. Um, but I think it, it's really indicative of the momentum that this um, fishing in MPAs as an issue is gaining. Um, we've got um, other work produced by uh, charities such as Oceana and then the, the actions by uh, Greenpeace. Um, and it's really um, building quite a lot of momentum, um, which uh, Jean-Luc will build upon them now. Can we have next slide, please? Yeah, thank you, Fred. So um, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yeah, so rather excitingly, the, there is a, a consultation out at the moment for four offshore marine protected areas. We have, I think, 76 offshore in the United Kingdom. So what's concerning is the pace of um, consultation on, on management of these sorts of activities in our offshore marine protected areas. Um, but at least perhaps the um, potential full closure of the Dogger Bank is, um, is shows the intention of what what government is thinking um, going forwards in this most important year of climate action. Um, if four sites out of 76 is not fast enough and we've made that um, case to government. So 
hopefully um, we can we can further pursue a, a faster pace of change with management of this most um, damaging activity in our offshore protected areas. Back to you, Fred. Thank you. Yep, so hopefully um, that's a fairly quick run through of the report. Um, you can find the report um, in, it, in its entirety on the MCS website um, together with a summary report. And if you'd like to have a look at the data in, the, in close detail, um, please do go across to the MPA reality check and have a look. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, did you have, was there any more of the presentation or is it, is it, are we ready to move on to questions? We're ready to move on. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you both. Um, a first question that came in um, was wondering what you think about the planned wind farm for Dogger Bank. I find it hard to understand how Dogger Bank would have whole site protection as you describe if this wind farm will be installed and would require whole site and and would whole site protection require a change in legislation? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's probably not um, that conducive to um, the idea of a whole site protection, but um, the needs of the um, re energy revolution require probably a greater, are a, probably a greater example than the concerns over proximate issues to do with biodiversity in my personal viewpoint. Um, it's a controversial subset because, of course, there's issues related to um, the, particularly the migratory species, so the, the whales, dolphins, and, and to a certain extent, seabirds. Um, but personally, I think the, the, the benefit of a wind farm is better than the losses, the losses of, of, of the potential for um, cetaceans and seabird activity. Um, there is some data from German and Dutch wind farms showing that cetaceans do indeed move a long, great distance away, maybe up to 30 kilometers during the time of installation um, and building, which of course increase, which, is in, which involves piling. So it's not gonna be good. <laughs> but we're repair, we, we are comparing apples and pears here. We must be mindful of that. There are winners and losers. This, the migratory species might have problems, especially in the short term, um, but the benthic species and the, the re-enhancement of the biodiversity and carbon storage capacity and sequestration capacity of oyster beds and mussel beds will, will, will vastly increase. And we are in a climate crisis. We, we've got to start being almost clumsy in this, I think, with the urgent pace of change to, to deal with eight meters of sea level rise by 2100, if we don't get on with this, is, is catastrophic. So um, we have to have that in the back of our minds. We are really causing problems for our grandchildren if we don't get on with some serious activity in dealing with these issues. It's my personal opinion. There we are. Okay, thank you guys. Um, there was a request that if you could paste uh, the citations about carbon storage and trawling impacts to the chat, is that possible? Uh, it's, it's, it, uh, if you people want to read the full report, um, it, we've cited all of those uh, elements of literature from the Mediterranean and United Kingdom in that full report. So you just go to that link that's on the slide now. Okay, okay, thank you. Look at the, look at the reference section. For that. Okay, all right, and I'll, I'll see if I can type that into it at some point. Um, so there's been a number of questions that have come in sort of looking at that linkage between bottom trawling and sort of acknowledging that there's a diversity of bottom gear which will have differential impacts and then to the loss of carbon storage and bottom sediments. What can you say more about, about those linkages? Like are, have there been any studies that have really looked at the linkage between the, the different bottom gear and the loss of carbon storage? I'm not aware of the minutiae of that. I am aware of the minutiae of different metiers or bottom toed fishing gears and their heaviness and their penetration depth from a lot of work by Mike Kaiser and Jan Hiddink at University of Bangor and now Harriet Watt. And um, my concern over that work, it doesn't really reference much of the historical baseline before such activity occurred of which I think the natural ecosystem can reach to vastly different um, states of biomass and function of a filter feeding seabed habitat that doesn't exist today. Now our seabed habitats are based on deposit feeders and scavengers. Um, the historical archive understanding of what happened before bottom trawling occurred in the 1880s um, is that there was, used to have vast rafts of oyster reefs and 
and um, sponges and corals that would have filtered the seawater to a vast degree and also changed the carbon budgets of the seabed. So um, I think by eliminating this activity in its entirety, we will enable much higher and long lived uh, communities to develop rather than individual perhaps um, elements of the ecosystem recovering and uh, maybe if they were to be trawled every 10 years to lose that um, growing biomass. Um, now in terms of how that relates to the individual carbon stores there was some work by a, a, a author called Brakeman I think she works on ecosystem engineers that occur in Dutch waters. Excellent work to show the importance of that that fringe between the benthos and the uh, lower parts of the water column and how oxygen and carbon cycling ha occurred in more pristine systems. Apart from that, I'm really not aware of the, the, min the minutiae. Maybe Frith could answer that in greater detail. Um, just to add that um, one thing that this project has shown me is that the carbon aspect of it is very much an emerging field. Um, and there are lots of questions that do at, at, are at the moment unanswered um, but a lot of people are looking into um, things like carbon cycling out at sea in the offshore sea, uh, sediments um, so it's it, I don't know the specifics right now but um, people are working on it at the moment okay um, and I'll just read some of the questions before we move on from this topic some of the sort of things people have wondered um, I, and if you have anything more to respond um, please feel free, but then we'll, we'll move on after that. Um, there was one question. I assume that the use of different gear types, dredges versus trawls versus seines, might result in the release of different amounts of carbon based on how they interact with the seabed, or that multiple passes of gear on the same path might have different release than fishing that is more spaced out. Um, can you accommodate these sorts of issues in your analysis? Um, another question that came up sort of in this realm is, uh, thanks for that this excellent presentation. Regarding carbon release from the sediment, is the assumption that bottom trawling will cause the release of all carbon stored or just a fraction of that? Um, and then there was an, another question. Um, wonderful talk, thank you. I'm curious to hear the underlying science that demonstrates that trawling leads to release of CO2 into the atmosphere. Can you talk a bit about the geochemical process and time frames, et cetera? So anyway, if there's, if there's anything more you can add now, um, great. If, if not, we have a bunch of other questions. Chris, do you want to take that? Yep, um, on the um, sort of the differences in, in the chemical cycling and that sort of thing, um, as we understand it, essentially there's uh, carbon exists in the seabed and seabed sediments in different forms um, and those different forms have different levels of reactivity um, so the most reactive form is called labile carbon this is the type of carbon that is the most bioavailable so it's, it's the one that gets broken down um, if released um, and then um, the least um, reactive is the recalcitrant carbon um, which is fairly stable um, and won't necessarily be broken down and, and converted into a form that can then be released into the atmosphere. Um, so it's the really, it's knowing the distribution of where that label carbon is, which is key to finding out where specifically the carbon will be released when it's trawled. Um, and that is something that, um, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> people are looking into at the moment and hopefully we're gonna try and build it into um, our analysis. Um, as far as we know, um, basically the muddier the sediment, um, the more likely it is to contain this labile um, reactive uh, carbon, which tends to be a little bit close to shore, um, especially where there's a lot of uh, riverine input. And this is a kind of plea to others, maybe listening in who are expert in this area. Um, one thing we, Frith and I, when we started to work on this, and then when we published a report, which is quite rightly open to criticism over its coarseness, I don't think the central message is crit is, uh, is, is, is wrong, um, but the coarseness of our approach has been necessarily um, quite blunt because we wanted to do this meta mega analysis or meta analysis. But what, what if anyone knows out there, what's the productivity of the pelagic system that relates to the benthos as well? So uh, my concerns over the denudish, the denuding of the oceans that have occurred over a hundred years means that the, the, the pelagic system has lost its biomass. We've lost, obviously through whaling our whales, but they're coming back. We know about the carbon sink element of dead whales on the seabed. Now, 
Another element that is in certain papers is the huge biomass of, of fin fish that we've lost through human consumption. And, and not just the carbon cycling within those organisms, but obviously the poop that they poop out. And where, does, where and how does that settle into the sediment? So we haven't looked at that budget in the carbon cycle at all, or the loss of that element of the ecosystem through probably 90 to 95% um, losses of biomass of, of, of fin fish in the North Sea, for example. So if anyone out there can help us with that and sort of to bring that to this debate, we'd like to see that included in the analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay, and there's uh, sort of two questions sort of centered on another topic of, of relative value. So I'll go with the first one. I'm curious, how does the cost of abatement compare to the economic value of fishing or of offshore wind development? Does the carbon storage value outweigh, outweigh these other uses or only build a case in favor of reducing bottom trawling? And sort of a, on a similar theme, there's another question. Uh, hi, Freth, great research. Do you know roughly what the value of fish caught from demersal fishing is within the MPAs? Not that this isn't a reason to protect habitats from bottom trawling. It would just be interesting to compare. Do you want to take that, Frith? Um, I don't know um, the cost in um, MPAs, um, but there is some research coming out uh, by the New Economics Foundation um, who are looking into basically, they've, they've basically done a cost benefit analysis, um, which we've fed this data into um, that finds basically after, I think it's the second or third year after you close an area uh, to bottom trawling, um, the economic benefits of having that, that area closed outweigh um, the costs um, to restricting the fishing there. Um, so that piece of research should be coming out fairly soon. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting piece that's, that um, potentially answer a lot of questions. And in that research, just to follow up from what Frith said, they are, they're not just looking at the carbon budget um, ecosystem service of benthic habitats. They're looking at um, the other services such as water purification process by filtration of organisms um, and uh, sort of stabilization of sediments close to seashores where you get salt marsh and seagrass habitats which protect seashores from as, as a natural defense. So there's other aspects of the economy that are within that economic assessment of a policy to close all bottom offshore MPAs to bottom towed fishing gears. And as Fritz says, yeah, so after about two, th two to three year cost, um, the, the economic budget is, is flipped and you start getting benefits, net benefits to such a policy. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, did you want to add anything before we move on? No. Okay. And I was just, um, just for everyone, uh, several um, uh, attendees have, have uh, sent in some resources they think would be very useful. And so uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. There's a question um, sort of related to what you were just talking about, do you know if other countries of the Dogger Bank, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, are planning to scale up the restrictions to bottom trawling in their areas now as the UK is moving ahead? Yeah, there's um, moves by our NGO friends in um, the Netherlands, Germany, and other member states that have a fishing stake within that site, such as the Danes, who almost exclusively have the, the biggest fishery, which is the otter trawl fishery for the base of the food chain, which is sand eels. Um, and it's, it's definitely the case that ourselves as authors of the report in one of the earlier slides, which is what appropriate assessment should be done on the Dogger Bank. That was a pan UK, um, Dutch and um, uh, Belgian report. Um, and, and basically what, what we've, we've tried to do is make sure that the European Commission who is the arbiter of the joint recommendations understands the legal limits by which it should be considering management of that, those parts of the site. So we hope that this pressure, particularly in Germany and in, which is probably looking for fairly green mechanisms anyway within its site and the Dutch government start to up the ante to push that level of protection to a higher degree. I mean, it's, if we can start using the climate crisis to sort of make an additional consideration of the role of these these places which for so long we're so tired of using the biodiversity argument as if it's as if it's so I know we need to apologize for it I mean that, it's absolutely crucial that we manage the seas in this way and I think that's 
that change in narrative is possibly occurring in the UK with the COP and climate emergency. And I think that might be fed into the processes that will occur in the other sides. I really hope so. Okay, and there was a follow-up that came uh, to this question. Um, is there any preliminary data on how those increased restrictions in other countries' jurisdictions might lead to fisheries displacement into British MPAs? No, I don't think so. Um, if you look at the Global Fishing Watch data that Frith produced that is illustrated in the report, the four years don't show a massive change in distribution of fishing, uh, fishing effort locations. Um, they tend to be hotspots where the hot, where the fish are. So we're talking in marine protected areas of some displacement, of course, of course there will be displacement, but the net benefit to that will be demonstrably greater in time if you adopt this policy than the, the consideration that there might be displacement. Um, we saw from the Grand Banks or the George's Bank closure in the 90s that fishermen were profiting by fishing haddock, haddock in greater catch per unit effort around the boundary of sites that were comparable in size to Dogger. Um, so yes, there'll be more fishing effort for sure around the boundaries of MPAs, but does that mean it's gonna be costing the industry anything greater? We just don't know. We've got just to implement the policy. Um, there's a greater need here for society's interest. Okay, thank you guys. Um, another question that came in, how will you characterize this issue at COP26 to get the attention of treaty negotiators? Do you have a desired in outcome at COP26 via the seabed carbon? Yeah, stop trawling in marine protected areas um, and to do it around, the Europe, around Europe's MPAs. We have the legal mechanisms to do it under the European laws. Um, over the entirety of sites, unless um, there's real clear evidence of no damage and no deterioration. But um, it, it, I think it's the pace, as I said earlier. I mean, if we do four sites a year, we'll be here for uh, until about 2040, um, dealing with management until, and then given the work that New Economics Foundation put into play, are offering us European NGOs, we're going to see a return on the investment of this policy only from about 2040 onwards. And we've got to be net zero by 2050. <laughs> so um, we've just got to get on with this and just implement it and start seeing the returns to the environment. And then we can bring perhaps a skeptical fishing industry along with us. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to another question. What can we as individuals do to make sure MPAs are given the protection they need? Right to your MP. That's okay. a simple one. Um, <laughs> nope. You know, uh, I think MPs are in the United Kingdom anyway, becoming more aware of this because Frith showed that the newspapers of, the, uh, of our country, not so much the uh, broadcast media, but the newspapers really picked up on this um, for, I hope, reasons of, of, of the, the importance of the environment to supporting life on this planet and the marine environment, a healthier marine environment. But perhaps, perhaps they were being politically expedient based on their editorship over the Brexit issue at the time, because we were able to show how much was fishing was occurring from different fleets. Um, but, you know, if we, if we can ride on this wave that creates better managed marine protected areas, I think our MPs are becoming more aware of what bottom trawling is and historically has been. And maybe that in MPAs, it just doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't make sense for the recovery of the marine environment. So I think using the understanding from this work, and we've tried to do a summary report, which is for MPs, um, and maybe it's needed across Europe and our European colleagues are using such arguments. And so we, we, can, we can use these, these levels of research to make a greater case than just biodiversity alone. Okay, thank you, Jean-Luc. Um, let's see, going back, there was one, uh, you, you addressed another question that was in the chat, which I suspect you read uh, and addressing this last one. Um, that we had one other question which hasn't come up yet. Um, some of the areas highlighted in the UK offshore shore area are subject to high degrees of hydrodynamic stress, which in some cases would likely result in similar disturbance to the seabed as trawling. Can this or how is this considered in the calculations of release of carbon from trawling? Well, it's not. As we said, it's a coarse analysis. So we just we put sediments together with the uh, metric from the Luizetti paper. So the um, we have heard about, um, you know, winter storms being more damaging than trawling from the fishing industry, and that might be true. 
Um, but hey, if you put biodiversity on top of it, it might not be true in 100 years if things grow and adapt into it. And also, some of the arguments are not protecting the entirety of sites so that um, are sandbanks offshore, there are peaks and there are troughs. It's definitely the case that the troughs host the greater biomass of benthic life, and it's probably where you could get growth occurring. But I don't think that, that those organisms might not migrate to the upper parts of sandbanks, um, by which point they would probably be doing quite well if uh, released from such impacts of bottom toe fishing gear. But um, um, yeah, I'm not absolutely certain of how to answer that myself, um, but the precautionary principle would suggest that perhaps we need to protect the sites over and above um, continuing to um, trawl them. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, there was a question that came in, should we stop calling them MPAs if they allow bottom toed fishing? Well, that's why we called the report marine unprotected areas, because <laughs> they are unprotected. Okay, well, that was lively. Um, we don't have any other questions that have come in. Uh, if anybody has any, if you send them in right now, we could probably tackle them. Other, uh, okay, well, that was a quick question. Um, someone wanted to note that FYI, much of the trawling and sandbanks occurs in the flanks, not the crests. Um, I'd also note, I, I think there are some great uh, resources that came in from lots of attendees, so we appreciate that. Um, Okay, and then I think well, we'll th th there's another question. Um, how do you feel about the headlines on your studies being used to promote xenophobic feelings against foreign vessel vessels in EU countries? Is there a way to focus beyond culprits and instead focus on collaboration for change? Yeah, completely. Great question. I hate it. I'm French. I'm half French. I'm a European. I'm pro EU. Even though we might have actually developed something that's positive from this mechanism. Um, I really wished we could have done something more collaborative with our EU colleagues, but it wasn't working. Whatever one side, the fishing industry and the NGOs say, it wasn't working. The joint recommendation process was producing management recommendations which would fail the ecosystem. So I feel it's, I, it's a lament that I have for leaving the, Europe, the European Union. It was set up so we didn't have any more world wars. It was set up so that we didn't go through an economic crisis because of individualism and nationalism. That's my personal perspective, being half French and being pro-Europe. But maybe this, this is a silver lining that we might see some really strict management measures that actually start to see returns on the investment of MPAs. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's a saddening thing, the, the loss of our, our EU friends and the EU projects for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, we have two more questions now. Um, can you say a bit more about nearshore areas and their use and the carbon implications of that? Chris, do you want to go into that? Yeah, um, so we obviously didn't look at inshore areas um, for this project, partly because uh, Global Fishing Watch data focuses um, on using AIS, which is only required on vessels greater than 50 meters. So um, the uh, number of smaller boats in the data is underrepresented so uh, we don't really focused offshore um, but inshore um, we believe the carbon stored in the sediments near shore is potentially um, more reactive um, because it's it's come from land and it hasn't hasn't had so much time to break down in the marine environment um, so it's likely um, that carbon stored in inshore MPAs might actually the disturbance of that carbon could be um, quite uh, significant um, for uh, carbon release um, in in muddy, particularly muddy areas. This is a particularly of interest in the west coast of Scotland, where there is a current debate as to whether there should be an entire closure of the three nautical mile limit to all bottom toed fishing gears, which would enable a much more benign type of fishery using pots and traps to to exploit the nephrops the longest themes in the area. That's a very hot topic. And to add this understanding of what mud habitats do in terms of carbon storage should, I think, um, um, should support a policy to close further areas closer to the coast in muddy areas. Okay, thank you guys. Um, to let everyone know the this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted um, on the openchannels.org website. You go to www.openchannels.org slash webinars. Um, and I'll, I'll type that into the chat for everyone too. Um, and it should be there with probably within a couple hours, but certainly within 
uh, 24 hours. Um, also, after the webinar, everyone will be get, send an email, which will have the link to that page. Um, OK, let's see. We, we have had some more questions come in. Um, there's a question. Do you see a difference between the offshore MPAs in the EU and UK? For Germany, our EEZ MPA sites are as well unprotected, in quotes. Well, as I said, there's some promising moves perhaps from Dogger Bank and three other offshore sites, one which is nearer the Wash in Norfolk and one in the south coast of um, the English Channel and then another one way, way, way off the southwest coast of Cornwall. So those are going for 80% to 100% levels of protection from such gear. So as I said, yeah, we're seeing a different approach to this because we don't have to negotiate with other member states fishing fleets as long as the management measures, as I said, is non-discriminatory and applies to all vessels. So I hope that this will focus minds in the joint recommendation process of the commission um, and make other member states applications to have fuller protection levels uh, fast tracked. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. I so hi, another question. Hi, I was wondering what you think about other effective conservation measures, OECMs, and their role in a network of properly protected MPAs, or even in a world of unprotected MPAs. Yeah, there are elements of that. We could get sort of like some benefits around wind farms, of course. Um, there are sort of fisheries closures, but the problem is they don't allow the biomass of the benthos to accumulate to historical proportions. Um, which is what we're envisioning with these um, left alone areas, like hundreds of years of being left alone. People would say this is absolutely ridiculous in Europe to consider the seabed being left alone for hundreds of years because we've always exploited that way. Well, we've only exploited that way for 120 years and the evolutionary dynamics of the organisms that used to persist in them have no idea how to persist through uh, benthic trawling. So um, <laughs> we need to change our mindsets. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question, is it possible that in the future carbon credits are similar, could be attached to MPAs given this approach and yeah. could it be scaled in terms of the value of the site? That's a very good point. I mean, I was listening to a really good um, podcast by uh, Mark Carney, who's the gov who is the ex-governor of the Bank of England, who I think is um, currently um, looking into advising UK government on economy and We've also had Dieter Helm of the Natural Capital Committee, and they're talking about carbon tax and carbon tax associated with perhaps something as as, uh, as 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 bottom trawling, not only the fuel that is used by the boats themselves, but perhaps the the, the collateral damage in terms of carbon that is occurring from such vessels, and maybe that would prohibit perhaps the activities or show their true costs, which might make the price of fish go up in which is equitable to the damage that is incurred from extracting those fish from the environment. So, um, and carbon taxes, particularly with nearshore environments, a very logical way to consider building up um, our salt marsh seagrass and um, mangrove and coral reef habitats around the world. Absolutely, it's, it sounds logical. Okay, thank you guys. Um, a question, thank you for the presentation. Have you considered looking at fishing data from World War I and World War II, where there was no fishing and reestablishment of fish stocks as an argument for refraining from trawling? Uh, no, we haven't. Maybe we should. Thank you for the su suggestion. Okay. Wind farms is gonna be an interesting one because those should be closed areas. So in a small way, much smaller, we'll have a look at that, which is probably more um, relevant to the scale of marine protected areas, because obviously in World War One and World War Two, nothing happened. Whereas we, we need to look at area based sort of sizes of, of closures or places where people aren't operating. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, what do you think about countries focusing designation of MPAs on currently unfished sites, i.e. avoiding fished areas? Yeah, it's a problem. I think, is it Steve Palumbi, um, one of the Australian institutions has talked about that. It's a concern, uh, and again, illustrative, illustrative of the point in the chat you brought up, Sarah, was uh, that people fish the sides of sandbanks. You know, we, we know from this work where people fish regardless of marine protected areas because they've ignored them because they haven't had to because there have been no laws to stop them. Now, that's also where the biodiversity can be sometimes because there's greater productivity in the system. And that doesn't mean the productivity is just in the water column. Um, now we tend to be fishing mostly in 
the, the demersal organisms because the pelagic organisms are, are, are less available. Oh, it's not true. But but we, where the fishing activity takes place, yes, we need to incur some closures in those areas as well. I would suggest for the productivity of those parts of the ocean to be restored. So as Frith illustrated those three sites, particularly the southernmost, which is Haysborough, Hammond and Winterton, it's just a tiny smidgen of the area that that fishery operates in that's caused huge consternation to the Dutch fishing fleet. But it's a tiny area. Could that not please perhaps recover in its organisms and the fish stocks that they are wanting to prosecute that spill over to the outside, not degrading their wider, larger fishing area? So we need a mix. I think that's what Palumbi said. We need a mix of places good for biodiversity, good for productivity in the ocean, and to ideally see as much closed as possible, possibly in a sequential basis. Okay. All right, well, we're getting lots of thanks coming in on the chat. I'd also note to, to Frith and, and Jean-Luc, there's lots of great resources that have been put into the chat too. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you to both Frith and Jean-Luc and everyone who participated. What a, what a great and interesting Q&A this was um, and great presentation before it. So- Half an hour yeah. of questions. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's exhausting, it's isn't it? It's dangerous. <laughs> It's exhausting. But uh, thank you, everyone. Um, super interesting discussion. Um, again, we'll be posting the recording uh, in a few hours, most likely, and definitely within 24 hours uh, to the Open Channel site. And we hope some several people have indicated they'll be sharing that with colleagues. So anyway, thank you all uh, for a great webinar. And we hope to see you in the future. Thanks.